Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel for part three of our butt kicker review coming up on today's episode of 2020 Flight Simmers. Welcome back. Before we get into the video, I just have one disclaimer. Butt Kicker did send me their product for review. However, I am not being paid for my videos and all the opinions about the Butt Kicker are mine and mine alone. Now, unlike the previous two episodes that I've done on the Butt Kicker, if you've missed them, check down below in the description. Now, in those episodes, I tried to keep it as objective as possible. In this one, I'm going to need to give you some of my opinions once we get to the pros and cons section. But just like all of my reviews, I'm going to keep it real and to the point. In today's video, we'll first go over the hardware setup for the butt kicker. So I know in part two, I showed you how to connect everything, but I had it sitting on the floor. I didn't really have it mounted anywhere. And it's really important that you have all of this hardware mounted properly so that you don't cause damage to the amp the cables, or the terminal ends. Second, we will go over all of my settings and the software that I'm using for the butt kicker. Now, some of you may be surprised, but I'm not only using the HaptiConnect software, I've got a little added bonus we'll talk about here in a moment. Lastly, we will go over a pro and cons list that I have been putting together over the past couple weeks using my wife as a test dummy in the other room. All right, so with that out of the way, if you have any questions throughout today's video, drop them down below in the comments section and I'll get right back to you. If you missed part one and two of this series, links will also be down there or you can click up here. If you enjoy today's content and find it useful, make sure to hit that subscribe, tick on that little bell and smash that thumbs up button. It is greatly appreciated. All right, so now let's jump right into the hardware setup and how I have everything mounted for my system. Okay, so now let me go over how I have finalized the setup of all of the butt kicker hardware on my system. Now, before I show you any of that, I want to show you my SIM setup first. And this is definitely not to brag, but other people might be in the same situation. And this will come into the pros and cons that we're going to go over later in the video. So let me flip you around and I'll show you what I've got to work with. Okay, so I took a step back so I could show you the full setup here. On the right hand side, this is where I do all of my work at my main desk. Over here is my modular SIM cockpit that I had built. The object of this modular setup was to actually slide underneath of my desk and then pull it out when I wasn't using it and move it off to the side. Now what I've done is I set my SIM cockpit off to the left hand side of my desk and I'm going to be moving my chair back and forth when I'm not using my SIM cockpit. So now I want to show you how I have hard mounted everything to avoid any problems that you may come into from moving your chair back and forth because you definitely don't want to ruin the terminal ends on the butt kicker and you don't want to be riding over the cable. All right, so first of all, you definitely don't want to have the amplifier sitting on carpet or anything like that because you need airflow. Now, this amplifier does not have any fans in it, so it's more of a passive airflow. So you really need to keep the bottom free so that the air can freely flow in and flow right through the top. So what I have done here, instead of having this sitting on the floor, is I created a simple shelf out of some plywood, put some 45 corners on it, and then mounted this to the side of my SIM cockpit. Now, the next thing I did to keep the cable secure, because you don't want the cable to get moved around, especially if you're in VR, you won't see it on the floor. So what I did first was I 3D printed some brackets that I can mount the cable into. And then I ran those brackets down the side of my cockpit and this will keep the cable securely attached to my sim cockpit the last thing i did and i think is most important you do not want to ruin the terminal end of your cable now as you can see on the cable part of this is exposed and the other part is not exposed if you were to ride over this with your chair you will definitely destroy the terminal end of this. Now the other thing to help save your amplifier from any surges is I've also installed a surge protector down here. And then when I'm not using all of the cabling for the butt kicker, 
it just get placed right there. Okay, so now let's jump over to the chair and I'll show you how I've mounted everything under the chair. And this is probably gonna be the most important because the chair is what you're gonna be rolling around and moving from your SIM cockpit to your desk or just converting your desk from your SIM cockpit back to your desk again. So let me show you what I did with the chair. All right, so to get a better look at the bottom of the chair, I decided to flip it over on its side here so I can show you everything. Now in part two, when I connected this up, I showed you that you are gonna lose about an inch and a half of clearance here for your chair to be able to come all the way down. Now the wire that's connected to the butt kicker is hard wired. This does not come disconnected from the butt kicker. And if it does, well, you probably just broke it. So what I've done is I've taken those clips that I've showed you earlier and I've screwed these into the bottom of my chair. And I kind of wrapped the wire around here, goes through another one of these cable ties, the back of the chair. And then I've also installed one of these protection covers so that the dongle here does not get damaged. Now the other thing I wanna show you is the dongle itself does not actually go all the way to the floor. So even if I forget to slide this into its protection cover, I will still not be able to roll over this with my chair. Once I get done using the butt kicker, I will then take this and slide it back into its little housing. All right, so that's how I have the butt kicker set up on my system. I hope I've given you some ideas to help prolong the life of your butt kicker on your system. All right, so that was my hardware setup for the butt kicker. I hope it gave you some good ideas. And for those of you asking, no, I don't have any of those parts for sale that I 3D printed. The next thing I want to get into is the software and the settings I'm using for the software, as well as the butt kicker itself. Now, as you know, we have the amplifier that has a volume setting on it, which I like to refer to as a power or a gain setting and not necessarily volume. So before I jump over into the software, I just want to apologize to Butt Kicker right now because they're probably not going to like what I'm going to be going over here. And that's because I've had to introduce a new piece of software to kind of complete the ecosystem that we need for Microsoft Flight Simulator. And that's because, well, yes, the HaptiConnect software from Butt Kicker is a great overall software for many, many games. But because they tend to a lot of different games, it doesn't do one singular simulator or game 100%. So that's why I have also included the SimHaptics software in my setting guide for Microsoft Flight Simulator. So without any further ado, let's hop right into the software and all my settings. So now what we're gonna do is take a look at the Butt Kicker HaptiConnect software side by side to the Sim Haptics software. I will then go over what settings that I use and what settings I don't use to kind of get the most immersive experience. So let me show you that. Okay, so now let's take a look at both pieces of software. I have the Hapti Connect from Butt Kicker on the left and the Sim Haptic software on the right. The first thing I wanna do is compare the amount of adjustable items in each of the software that we have. On the Hapti Connect software, we only have about 10 things that we can adjust here. And in my opinion, that leaves a lot of room for improvement because there's many more things that happen in an aircraft that is just not on this list. Now, if we take a look at the Sim Haptic software, we have about 20 different items here that we can adjust. Now you might say, well, that gives us all the adjustment that we need. Why would I wanna use the Hapti Connect software also? Let me explain this. Now I'm gonna use the turbulence setting as a general reference point because we have that setting in both the HaptiConnect software as well as the SimHaptics software. The issue I found with the SimHaptics software when I've got turbulence set, it does not match the turbulence that I see in the aircraft when I'm flying. So as you're flying along and the, the plane starts bumping around, the turbulence setting in the SimHaptic software is just not in sync with the plane, if it even gives you the feedback in the first place. And that is completely different than how the HaptiConnect software feels using the turbulence haptic setting. When I use the turbulence in the HaptiConnect software, 
it is almost one for one. If I see that plane start to bob or move, you will feel it with the butt kicker. So in my opinion, it is more realistic using the turbulence in the Hapti Connect than in the Sim Haptics. My feeling is the Sim Haptic is just throwing in some turbulence here and there to make it feel like you're in a plane, but you're not actually getting the actual turbulence from the telemetry data from the simulator. So that's one of the reasons why I use the turbulence in Hapti Connect, and I do not use it in the Sim Haptics hardware. Also, Touchdown is another haptic event that I find is a little bit off in the Sim Haptics software than in the Butt Kicker software. Now, one thing to know about the Sim Haptics software is that we have the ability to change the actual effect that you feel. Now, for instance, uh, I'm going to use flaps. If you're in an aircraft that's using a handle for flaps, well, you're not going to hear a flat motor up and down. That's not what you want to feel in your butt kicker because that's not what the plane has. If you have a lever to adjust your flaps, it's going to be more of a clunk. So that's where the Sim Haptic software is much more customizable because we can actually make each haptic movement feel like what it's supposed to feel like. And that is a game changer. However, when it comes to certain things like turbulence that you can have random setting or touchdown that you can have random setting, that means that when I touch down the plane again, sometimes I feel the touchdown and sometimes I don't. And sometimes it's just way too hard of a vibration that doesn't correspond with the actual landing. So what I've done was, in this instance, I've used a combination. So I've used the Hapti Connect touchdown as well as the Sim Haptics touchdown. In the Sim Haptics software, I only keep my touchdown setting about 50%. And that's because anything over that, especially if you have it set on random, you may get an extra hard clunk out of the butt kicker itself. Now that's one thing that I talked about in part two, and when you're setting this up and going through your settings, you definitely don't want to hear clunking coming from the butt kicker. Now because they offer random effects, some effects are just stronger than others. Now when it comes to my Hapti Connect software, all of these settings stay exactly the same. So for RPM, I leave it at 48. Turbulence, I leave it at 50. And touchdown, I leave it at 90. Even at 90% or even 100 on touchdown, I never like to max anything out. But even at 90%, if I land very hard, it still doesn't give me a hard clunk. So for the Hapti Connect software, these are the only three settings that I'm using inside of this software. For the Sim Haptic software, of course, they have a bunch of different settings here, and some may apply to your aircraft, and some may not. Okay, so now you've got your software downloaded, your butt kicker is ready to go. Where do you start with your settings? Firstly, what I would do if you're using just a standard desk chair, turn the volume or the power control on your butt kicker itself down to 25 and we're going to start there. Now, you might find that you need to increase that, but I'll show you how you're going to know if you need to do that or not. In the Hapti Connect software, I'm going to leave everything as is, and I'm not going to touch anything for now. So now we're going to move to the Sim Haptics software. In the Sim Haptics software, we have a couple tabs at the very top. In the setting tab, here's where we can adjust the output and how many butt kickers that we're using. So for me, I'm only using one butt kicker and I've only got one output to the butt kicker. So you wanna make sure your multiple output is not ticked and I'm gonna select my butt kicker audio option. Below that, we have the arrangement. So if you have more than one butt kicker, how they're arranged, either in stereo, surround, or mono. If you have just one, then you're gonna select mono. Below that, we also have another volume slider or as I like to call, a power slider. Because we're not really talking about sound here, although you will hear some sound. We are mainly talking about the power 
that it's going to take to create the vibration that you need to feel. Now, with any sliders, like I said earlier, I don't like to turn anything up to 100%. So what I like to do is to not go over probably 80 or 90% on my sliders. If you have to go over that, there's not much more that you're going to feel after that. You get some diminishing returns once you go above that point. So what I've done here with the master slider is I set it to about 80 or 90 percent and then I'm just going to leave it there. All of the rest of the settings that we're going to adjust are going to be in the SimHaptic software itself or we may need to increase the amplifier power. But before you jump into increasing the amplifier power, that is going to be the last thing you want to do is increase your amplifier power if you don't need it. Because the higher the power that you increase your amplifier to, the more heat that that amplifier is going to produce. The more heat it produces, the less of a lifespan that that amplifier is going to have. It's all a balancing act to get the feel that you want and not overheating and overpowering the amplifier. Bottom section, the general section, we have a couple options here. The sliders value I also like to keep on so you know the exact number that that slider is at and you can write that down or take a screenshot so this way when you're playing with your figures you know exactly where you are and you're not just guessing uh, where you're putting that slider. I also like to use the full list slider so this way I can see all of the settings and I don't have to scroll up and down uh, through all the various settings. I do want to go over one more tab of the SimHaptic software in the About section. Here is where you can check for any updates. So you'll click on Website. At the very top of the website will be Updates. You can click on that and see if you're using the updated version. Now let me run through what I do inside of the SimHaptic software to start getting my baselines. First, what you want to do is go through each of the items here and untick any of the ones that don't really pertain to the aircraft in which you're flying. Once you have done that, then what I like to do is go through each of the effects and I'm going to hit the test button on the right hand side. During this test, you're checking for a couple things. One, that you can feel the vibration that it's supposed to be occurring. Two, that it's the correct vibration for the aircraft and the sound that you hear when you activate that in the aircraft. Just like I said with the flaps, if I have a mechanical flap handle, I want to feel the exact same vibration pitch to that sound through my butt kicker. I will then go through all the various effects for that option and use the one that matches the sound that I hear in the aircraft. Now that's really going to be important, especially when you get to engine, because with engine noises, if you're in a radial engine, that feels and sounds completely different than a turbine engine. And the turbine engine is going to feel and sound completely different than a piston-driven engine. So you really want to match the tone that you hear of the engine with the vibrational feel and sound that you get through the butt kicker. I hope that makes some sense. So what you hear and what you feel, you want to match in pitch. And then it really gives you that immersive experience. So now that you have chosen the correct effect for that action, you now have to increase the power slider for that option. Now I'm going to give you a for instance here. We're going to use the avionics as an example. Because avionics, well granted, they you're not going to feel a lot in the aircraft. It's a very faint vibration that you're going to feel when the avionics come on. But now here's the thing. Let's say that you go to test your avionics. And for instance, on my screen here, it says 15. And maybe you can't feel it at all. So you turn that slider up and up. It might be almost at 100 before you barely start to feel it. If you're that person then what you need to do is increase the power on the amplifier itself. So I will then increase the amplifier power by about one or two and then retest that option again. Now I like doing this on the low vibration items first because once you get into the higher vibrational items, say touchdown, 
or uh, ground roll or something like that, those are going to be pretty powerful. And you can always adjust the sliders down to get the feel that you're going for. If you have any questions about that, please let me know down below in the comments section. Now, this is going to be a starting point. And I say that because once you actually start to fly now, you may feel that some of these things that you had set are just not powerful enough. So for instance, let's say you've gone through and we're going to use your gear as a example here. Now the gear up and down, you've gone through, you set your effect and you've set your intensity for that. Let's say that you have just taken off and you're feeling all of the vibration from the engine, the gear drag, your flap drag, and you go to put your gear up. Well, now maybe you don't feel it as much as you did when you were going through your testing because it's maybe drowned out a little bit by all of the other effects going on. Now, one thing that the SimHaptic software does, well, at least what I feel, is that once a new effect comes into play, say something new happens, a new event happens, it will dummy down the vibration you feel from everything else to kind of put that new effect in front of everything so you feel that one predominantly more than anything else. Once that effect is done, it will then increase all of the other effects again. That doesn't necessarily always work. So like I said, if you've taken off and you're feeling all these other vibrational effects, you go to put your gear up and now you're like, well, it doesn't really feel as, as clunky as it did when I did my testing. So now you might have to make slight adjustments to those gain levels or power levels on each of those settings. Now also keep in mind that if you do adjust the power on the amplifier itself, you may also then need to adjust some of your gain settings in the sim haptics as well as the hapti connect and that's because you're going to be changing the overall power level so you're going to need to change around your gains to get the feel that you want but i can't stress this enough the one thing that you do not want to feel at all is a hammer banging against that butt kicker if you're hearing that throughout your flight, when you're hitting turbulence or when you're landing, you can pretty much say goodbye to that thing in a short few months because you are overextending the transducer that's inside of the butt kicker itself. That transducer is going to its complete extents, banging off the little bump stops that are in there. And that's what's giving you that dunk, 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 dunk kind of noise. So if you're hearing that, you want to bring down the gain on whatever option that is. The other thing that I like in the SimHaptic software is when something is activated, it will be lit up in green. I believe it's green. So you can see exactly what is creating that effect so you can then adjust it. All right, so that's how I go through setting up all of my settings for the butt kicker. If you want to try out some of my settings, go to the cloud and... Uh, do a search there and I you should be able to find them in there. If you have any questions about this, please let me know down below in the comments section and I'll get right back to you. I hope I've given you some good pointers as to where to start and how to adjust things if you're not getting the proper feel out of them. I will also have links down below in the description for the Hapti Connect software as well as the Sim Haptic software. I am not affiliated with either of the two and I did pay for my sim haptic software. All right, so I'm sorry to talk your ear off through the software and settings portion, but there's just so much that I had to go over there to really get the full experience out of the butt kicker. All right, so last up on the agenda today is we're gonna go over the pro and cons list for the butt kicker. And we're gonna start with the cons first, and then we'll jump into the pros. I will also go over some alternatives to the butt kicker if you are someone who may not be able to use this in your situation. So with that, let's start off with number one. And I think this is the biggest thing. I had to use my wife to help me out with this. And that is noise. Now you have to understand that when you have vibration and you have frequencies, you have tones to create that vibration, you're going to also create noise as a byproduct say you're in an apartment situation and you're not on a ground floor, the people under you are probably going to get a little upset. Now, if you are on a concrete slab, that is probably the best case scenario that you could have. 
And that's because there's not going to be any vibrational transfer through the concrete. And that means you're not going to be transferring any of the noise from the vibrations. Now, my wife sits right in the next room behind me. And while I was gaming, I asked her, well, what does it sound like when I'm in here playing? So from her mouth, she said it sounds like I have a theater room in here. So if you had some big subwoofers going and things like that, that's what it sounds like in the other room. So the next question I had, well, was it too distracting for you to watch TV? And she said, well, no, not really, because it's not loud. So you're not hearing the sound as far as vocals. So you're not really getting the high pitch acoustical sounds and it's not really messing with what she's watching on TV. But she said, definitely, it sounds like there's a huge theater in here and you're watching some movie like Top Gun or something, because that's what it sounds like. So now let's talk about a solution to the vibrational noise that you're going to hear. Now, one thing you can do is put a rubber mat underneath of your chair. But not just any rubber mat, you need it to be, you know, maybe three quarters of an inch or an inch thick. And that's because you need something to absorb the vibrations from the butt kicker so that it doesn't transfer that energy into your floor and into sound that will then hear throughout the rest of your home. The best place that I have found to get a mat like that would be tractor supply if you have one in your area. Now, I've also seen these in Home Depot as of recently, horse stall mats. So the rubber mats that you would put in a horse stall, they're about an inch thick or three quarters of an inch thick, somewhere around there. But one thing that you don't want to do is go to Staples or Office Depot and get one of those real thin plasticky type of mats to put, you know, that you would put on carpet or something to prevent your chair from messing it up. That's just not going to do it. So how much will it decrease the vibration from the chair? I don't know. That's going to be something that you would have to test. And unfortunately, the only way to test that is to purchase the butt kicker in the first place. So for my recommendation, if you have any doubt that it's going to upset some people in your home or your neighbors, then I just wouldn't get it. All right. So you've decided, you know what? I don't think I can deal with that type of vibrational noise from the butt kicker. What other options do I have? I don't have a room for a motion rig. There is a company that has created a haptic seat pad for your seat that you would sit on. I believe it's called the HF8. I'm not 100% sure, but I'll put some pop-ups here to let you know what that is. Now, there's some disadvantages to this as well, which I'll go over here in a second. Now, with the haptic seat pad, that has various motors that are going to be in different spots of the pad. That's going to go down the back of your chair as well as underneath of your seat. Now, I personally do not own one of these, but I can only conclude that there's going to be some inherent issues that people might have. So let me discuss some of those issues that you may have if you purchase that chair. And if you have one, please let me know down below in the comments if what I'm going to go over doesn't really play that big of a role. Now, the first thing I want to say is I bought a very nice office chair so that I can flight sim for a couple hours at a time and not have my bum get hurt. Well, the last thing I want to do is put a seat pad over top of my really comfy chair to then have little transducers or vibrating motors in them that I'm now going to feel. So what I mean by that is on that haptic pad, there has to be some sort of mechanical hardware that's going to create a vibration. So whether it's a little motor that's spinning like this, or whether it's a transducer like the butt kicker, there is some piece of hardware that's going to be within this pad. I can only imagine that you're going to feel those little transducers or vibrators in all the different areas of that pad. That leads me into the next question is realism. What is going to be the most realistic for your simulation experience? So let's first dissect how the vibrations are felt in a real plane. So you have your pilot seat that is attached 
to the frame of the aircraft. The way you feel vibrations from a motor or anything in the aircraft, those vibrations are reverberated through all of the framing, the floor of the aircraft, and it kind of channels right up to your seat and you feel it on your entire seat coming from the base because the back of your seat's not connected to the frame. The floor, the bottom of the seat is connected to the frame. So all of the vibration that you feel in a normal aircraft would usually be coming from the base of the chair and working its way up. That is the exact premise as how the butt kicker works. The butt kicker is attached to the bottom of your chair, the post of your chair, and you feel that vibration all the way up from the chair. Now, if we take a look at the HF8, the haptic seat, well, that's a little bit different. With that software, that actually allows you to control all the various transducers or motors, whatever is in that seat. The software gives you full, complete control over all of the transducers in that seat pad. Now, my personal opinion, when I put my flaps up and down, I don't just want the back to vibrate. I don't just want to feel it in my legs or my lower back. I don't want to feel it in my shoulder blades only. And that's kind of what they boast on their website. You can set individual zones of that seat to vibrate to give you a vibrational cue or a feeling so that you know that something that you have that set for is happening. But the problem with that is that's not how you feel the vibrations in a real aircraft. You feel it from your bottom first and works its way up. So when it comes to realism, I think that the haptic seat pad is a great alternative for those that just can't deal with the noise or are in an apartment situation and you just need to keep the noise level down, then yes, it's probably a really good alternative. Nothing is going to give you that feeling than either a real plane or the butt kicker because it's actually emulating the vibrations that you would normally feel and they are coming from the correct location of that seat. So I hope that answers your question as to which one is going to be more realistic. If you have any questions about that, just let me know down below in the comments. And if you are someone who owns a butt kicker and the haptic seat pad, let me know what your feelings are on both of them. Okay, so the next con that I have is, like I showed you earlier with my sim setup, I need to move my chair from one spot to another every time I'm going to either be working at my desk or if I'm going to be flying on the simulator. Now, because of that, that introduces some more issues. The big thing is you do not want to mess up the dongles, the terminal ends that are on those cables. The cable that comes from the amplifier can be replaced. The cable that's attached to the butt kicker, like I showed earlier, is solidly attached. And if that comes loose or breaks off, then I think you've broken your system and you need a new transducer, or maybe you could send it in for repair. So the next con that I have is somewhat small, but it would be mounting the amplifier itself. Like I showed in part two where I was connecting everything, the amplifier was sitting on my floor and that was carpeted. And you don't want to use that as a permanent location for the amplifier because the way the amplifier cools itself is through passive cooling. There's no fans inside of the amplifier, so it relies on thermodynamics to pull cool air in from the bottom and expel that air from the top. As far as the service is concerned with Butt Kicker, I did have a subscriber reach out to me and tell me that they had an amplifier that did have a problem after the warranty and Butt Kicker did replace that for them. Now, I'm not going to say they're going to do that with everybody, but that just goes to show you the type of service that you can expect with Butt Kicker. The next thing I want to talk about, and it goes along with airflow, is heat. Because I've seen a lot of reports online that people have had amplifiers go bad, they get overheated. Now, my first thought was, well, if that happens, I'll just 3D print a top to go on top of the Butt Kicker amplifier, put a fan in there. However, if you set everything up like I explained in the settings video, 
I don't think you're going to have an overheating problem at all. The only time I think people are going to have overheating issues is if you turn that amplifier up to 40, 50, 60. I don't even know if it goes to 60. So yeah, if you turn it all the way up, yeah, you'll probably overheat the amplifier because it's just not meant for that. Now you might say, well, why would they allow you to turn it up so much if they don't want you to? Well, because that's the way things have to work. You don't want to max anything out. Same thing with this. You can't run something at 100% max capacity all the time. It won't last. Now, I've used this for long sessions, about two hours or so, keeping my amplifier set on a power setting of 25. At the end of my testing, I go down and feel the amplifier itself, and I was going to take my laser thermometer and shoot it because I wasn't sure if it was going to be very hot or not, and to my surprise, it was warm to the touch. It was warm, but it was not hot at all. And since installing it, I have not had any issues with heat. So as long as you're respectable in your settings, then I don't think you're going to have a problem with the amplifier overheating. The last con that I wanted to talk about and I brushed over this earlier when I was showing you how everything's set up, is the loss of height that you're going to lose when you install the butt kicker on the post of your chair. Now, I've done a measurement in episode number two about the bracket that's on the butt kicker is about an inch and a half. So if you're someone that needs to put that chair all the way down to make it comfortable at your desk, you're not going to be able to do that when the butt kicker's mounted to the post. So that's one thing you want to do is raise your chair up so that you have about an inch and a half of clearance of the post showing and then see if that's acceptable for you to fly in your home cockpit. If it's not, then don't get the butt kicker unless you plan on mounting it in a different location, which is possible because they do have three mounting holes for the transducer. I would try to refrain from mounting the transducer to the bottom of the chair. So what I mean by that is the little clips that I use to hold the cable in, now they're mounted to the bottom of the chair. It's a piece of MDF or something that's under that chair or plywood, and that's what all the foam is built on. Well, you don't really want to screw your transducer into MDF or plywood because it's going to vibrate loose and it's going to wind up falling off. So the transducer should be mounted to something metal. And also metal will be a better conductor of the vibration than MDF or wood. That's going to dampen that vibration a little bit. So that's about the last con that I can see with the butt kicker. If you have anything to add to the conversation, please let me know down below in the comments. So now let's go to the flip side and talk about some of the pros of the butt kicker. And I think the biggest pro that there is with the butt kicker is that it feels very realistic. I really don't think there's anything else out there that can give you the type of feel that you get with the butt kicker, well, unless you get into a real plane. So that in itself is, well, the main reason why you want to buy it in the first place is to get a more realistic feel when you're in flight sim. And if you're using the butt kicker in VR with off-ear speakers or earbuds or earphones, it really takes your flight sim experience to the next level because now you don't hear the vibrational noise of the butt kicker and you can really hone in on the sounds that you get inside the plane through your headset and you can then tune into those same feelings through the vibrations that are coming through your chair. So that, in my opinion, is the main reason to get the butt kicker. Now, also, if you're someone that does not have the room for, let's say, a Dolph Reality or a Yaw full motion cockpit, this is probably the next best thing at a very, very reasonable price. You're not going to have to spend $3,000 to get some realistic feedback from your aircraft, you'll be able to do that for under $300 with the butt kicker. The second pro that I have about the butt kicker, and I kind of touched on this when we talked about alternatives, is that I get to use the seat that I paid for and not be hindered by some pad that I've now got to sit on that's going to be between me and the seat. So I'm not going to disrupt my comfort level 
while I'm flight simming, and that is another big thing for me. So with that being said, I think that's going to wrap us up for today's video. Thanks everybody for joining us here on the channel. If you have any comments or questions about the butt kicker, please let me know down below in the comments section. And if you haven't done so, make sure to hit that subscribe, tickle on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button. To all my flight simmer friends around the world, keep the blue side up, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching, everybody.